Good afternoon, everyone. This is Steve Love. I'm President and CEO, Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council, and we want to give you a warm welcome and thank you so much for being uh, with us today for this educational webinar, and it's hosted in coordination with one of our associate members of the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council, Send a Ride. And today's topic deals with patient transportation. And we all know how important that is in today's industry. And we've got two expert speakers. They're gonna talk about some of the innovative ideas that they have developed related to patient transportation for hospitals, which as you know, is a very hot topic. So we're gonna discuss how patient transformation is a smart investment it can actually help improve the overall community's health status, and it can help overcome some of the transportation deserts that we encounter, especially when we look at the social determinants of health. And you want to choose a partner who really knows how to navigate through this very regulated industry. And our speakers today are going to include Greg Myers, who is the Director of Strategic Growth at Send a Ride, and Laura Fleet, CEO and founder of Send a Ride. Now, Greg's a senior healthcare financial executive, over 30 years experience in financial operations development, strategic development, and doing different types of alternative financial arrangements with health plans and physician groups. Laura, who I uh, spoke with extensively uh, not long ago is a leading expert in healthcare and regulatory law, has done a lot of this work in Oklahoma. She's represented health insurers, providers, hospital systems for more than 20 years. Not only is she legal counsel, she served as a lobbyist in Oklahoma and as exec executive director in healthcare in delivery systems. And the thing I really enjoyed about talking to Laura she really set this up correctly. She understands all the stock regulations. She even gets business associate agreements with the people that drive and send a ride. So I can assure you from a regulatory point of view, they've got everything covered. And I'll also like to say that I think most of us here have a lot of respect for Integris, which is a large healthcare system in Oklahoma, and they've been doing work for Integris for a number of years, and they wanted to expand and move more into the DFW market. And so we're delighted that they're an associate member of the council. So without any further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Greg Myers. Greg, we'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, I wanna express our appreciation for you hosting us today. We're excited to be a an associate member of the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council. And special thanks to everybody who's listening in today. I, I know how busy your schedules are on a daily basis, and I really appreciate you taking some time to visit with us. Uh, I, I wanna make a little editorial comment before we actually start the presentation. Uh, Laura and I have had the opportunity to talk to healthcare providers uh, from Miami to San Diego. And one of the things that uh, I, I, I want to compliment the Dallas-Fort Worth region on how advanced you are in really making sure that you address good health care for your community. It's, it's been a joy for us to see the relationship between the healthcare community and the uh, employer community in organizations such as the Hospital Council uh, the Hospital Council's Education and Research Foundation, the Dallas Medical Resource Group, uh, really indicates to us that you have a strong focus on the infrastructure that's required to deliver good health. And that's why we are glad to speak to you today because we think obviously transportation is a key part of that infrastructure. So Steve mentioned, uh, Quick uh, review of the agenda. We're gonna look at the health status of communities, overcoming uh, transportation deserts. That may be a new term for some of you. Uh, hopefully make the case that patient transportation is a smart investment. 
and then go over some criteria on how to evaluate the, uh, the right transportation partner. So let's take a little bit look at the uh, improving the health com of communities. You know, uh, you can see on the slide, there is just a very short list of all the value-based programs that CMS is rolling out, uh, the commercial payers are rolling out. I think the, the key uh, point of this slide is that by 2020, the industry states that 59% of all healthcare payments will come from some sort of a value-based model. <clears throat> The, the question that's kind of interesting, though, is uh, the Harvard Business Review did a presentation uh, about a year ago, and it says, we want to get value-based healthcare, but we really don't know what that means. And so the University of Utah Health Sciences Center did a survey of about 6,000 patients, physicians, and employers to see if they could get some consensus on what is value-based healthcare. And to no surprise from the provider community, it was uh, good clinical outcomes. From the employer community, it was cost containment and uh, reducing expenditures. But interestingly, from the patient community, <clears throat> the uh, two topics that really surfaced were the affordability of their healthcare and things like the quality of the nursing staff and things that were really totally opposite from the provider community. But one of the things I think that everybody agreed on that a, a good universal definition for value-based care is to provide the right care at the right time and in the right setting. So one of the things that uh, has uh, determined has surfaced as the concept of social determinants. And you can see on the screen sort of a long definition of social determinants. But one of the things that I thought was really particularly interesting, having spent 40 plus years in the healthcare industry, was the relatively uh, low ranking of clinical care as a determinant. You can see how important social and economic factors are how important health behaviors are, clinical care, and then physical environment. And obviously transportation is really kind of a, a key factor in social and economic uh, determinants. I, uh, since it was a relatively new term to me, <clears throat> I went online on Google and took in, typed in social determinants of healthcare and up popped more than 40 million uh, different results. And if you put in social determinants of healthcare conferences, you'll see more than 33 million entries. And so what I thought was really kind of a contemporary topic really doesn't turn out to be the case. You can go back to the early 1800s and you can see that there was a number of scientists writing at the turn of the century, really focusing on the importance of structural determinants of health. So what we all think is really kind of a now topic really is about 200, uh, 200 years old. The reason it's important today though, is as more and more providers enter into value-based kinds of arrangements, they're beginning to realize the importance of screening for social determinants and realizing the impact that social determinants make uh, as was highlighted on the previous slide. <clears throat> What's also interesting is most of the financial structure on new payment models that are based on outcomes really drive cost savings to the provider community. And it's created funds and the opportunity to be able to invest in infrastructure which is a topic that was really never thought of in the old fee-for-service world. So obviously transportation has a big impact on the health of community. You can see some uh, key uh, metrics here. There have been many, many studies done on the impact of transportation. You can see every year that 7 million people and over 3 million children miss medical appointments 
because they don't have transportation. Those missed appointments cost the healthcare industry over $150 billion. And the result uh, of that is uh, continually increasing patient no-show rates somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 35%. And we'll talk about those in a few minutes. What's also interesting is a recent survey of patients said if they had assistance with their transportation, it would help prescription refills after discharge. Uh, for those of you who have been involved in transitions of care and, and post-discharge patient follow-up, I'm sure you've often found out that the patients are not so compliant on their uh, medications, either because they don't understand them at the time of discharge or simply because they don't have the ability to get to the pharmacy to pick up those uh, prescriptions. So one of the things that has been identified is uh, four basic challenges that really impact transportation. The first is vehicle access. Uh, you'll see a study by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation pointed out uh, a fact that was somewhat sur surprising, and that is that people with access to private transportation are far more likely to go to medical appointments than those who rely on public transportation. And as you know, for many in the community, public transportation is really the only option that they have. Second uh, factor is uh, transportation affordability. And, and the third bullet point really jumps off and points out the fact that people earning between $5,000 and $30,000 per year spend as much as 24% of their income on transportation. <clears throat> and uh, at that poverty level, transportation becomes just about as important as a house payment if they should happen to have a house. And it's uh, really a factor that affords uh, the ability to get to medical appointments. Third factor is policy and infrastructure. There are some communities that do a wonderful job with public transportation. Those communities are found to have better, healthier outcomes. But unfortunately, there's still far too many communities throughout the United States that don't have adequate public transportation due to funding levels, governmental policies, uh, others, other uh, respective topics. And that really creates a situation of health inequity in, in our population. The final challenge is place, time, and distance. <clears throat> Patients often cite the fact that they don't have access to the transportation is, is a barrier to, to, uh, to their healthcare utilization. And another uh, factor that a number of studies have shown is there's a direct correlation between how far a patient lives from their healthcare in relation to the amount of healthcare they get. And this is really not just a, an urban phenomenon. If you look at rural communities, urban communities, metropolitan communities, that correlation holds true, uh, a definite, a definite uh, relationship between the ability to access transportation and the ability to access their health care. <clears throat> so when you put all these together, it's a perfect recipe for transportation. And the first time I looked at this term, I thought, dessert, what's a dessert? But anyhow, it's uh, transportation deserts. <clears throat> transportation deserts are communities, quite often in large cities, that really have far more of a demand for transportation than the supply for it. You can see that in a lot of large cities, one in eight residents live in a transportation desert. And a number of different studies have shown that between 10 and 50% of patients reported again that transportation was a barrier to healthcare access. And one of the things that's really impacting this is just younger white collar workers are actually moving back into the cities and really creating uh, an increase in supply for trans and demand for transportation in relation to the supply that's that's uh, available. And unfortunately, what this means is 
uh, poor and elderly residents are being priced out of their own cities and access to transportation and being pushed farther and farther from transportation hubs. <clears throat> and often these are the populations that need access to transportation the, mo the most. <clears throat> One thing that was interesting uh, is the fact that fewer Americans are choosing to own their vehicles or even get driver's licenses. I have a granddaughter who's 18, has no desire to get a driver's license. Uh, and I remember when I was 16, and I remember when I was 14, I was chomping at the bit to get a driver's license. But when I talked to her about this, she said most of her friends don't even have driver's licenses and don't really have a desire to get driver's licenses. So that's a socioeconomic factor, I think, that's really going to uh, impact us going forward in the future. So I apologize that this map is probably uh, a little hard to read, but the University of Texas uh, did a study of all metropolitan areas in the country and determined areas of transportation deserts and uh, transportation oases. And this is a map of the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area. <clears throat> you can see the uh, light green is a transportation oasis, meaning there's much more of a supply for transportation than there is a demand. However, over on the Dallas side, there's a lot of areas that have been identified as transit deserts, areas where the demand for transportation far outseeds the uh, supply for it. In the Dallas-Fort Worth area, they estimated that a little under 6% of the population reside in a transportation desert going forward. So, <laughs> One of the things that uh, is open for a debate is the whole area of, is it wise to invest in social determinants? Can you really demonstrate a return on investment through investing in that? It's our position that transportation is a smart investment and we'd like to talk a little bit about why those numbers back up that fact. Here's a study that was done by Deloitte in 2018 that we think really makes the business case. You can see that patients with unmet transportation needs are 2.6 times as likely to report multiple ER visits and 2.2 times as likely to report an inpatient visit during any 12 month period. Patients who live in transportation deserts and have higher transportation risk had an average of 41% more excess days in the hospital. 66% of physicians really believe that assisting healthcare transportation and arranging for it definitely helps patients. But at that time, only 2% felt there was responsibility to arrange for transportation because a number of them were concerned that it would be viewed as an inducement and violate safe harbor regulations. So the OIG has recently created a safe harbor that now allows, allows providers to pay for transportation without violating any uh, inducement law. So we're gonna look at two populations, medical groups and hospitals themselves. <clears throat> You can see the note there that studies have shown that missed appointments can cost up to $150,000 per year for each physician. And clinics offer, often suffer from uh, inefficiency because of missed appointments. We think providing transportation can definitely help the physician-patient relationship. Obviously, it can increase medical group revenue. But the one thing that often kind of goes unsaid is really can assist physician to meet quality metrics associated with the value-based program, programs that they participate in. If you've ever taken a look at these types of arrangements, one of the very first key metrics is measuring how easy it is for patients to come up and visit their primary care physician within a week or two following discharge from the hospital. Lack of transportation definitely is a barrier that keeps uh, a lot of physician groups from meeting that metric. 
<clears throat> Studies have shown that uh, the missed appointment phenomenon is actually getting worse. Let me just cite a, a few facts here for you. Typical primary care practice will have 18, 19% uh, no-show rate. Pediatric practice will have a 30% no-show rate. Ophthalmology, 22%. Even dentistry is 15%. Now, we're not going to make the case that transportation is the sole reason for no-shows, but we think, obviously, it has a big impact. And when you calculate the revenue per physician visit to be somewhere between $125, $350 a visit, you can see that it can generate a significant return on investment for primary care physicians, surgical physicians, and non-surgical specialist physicians. Reducing that no-show rate is a key driver towards medical group financial success and sustainability. It's a little different on the hospital side. <clears throat> American Hospital Association recently surveyed hospitals about their views on social determinants. And 72% of the hospitals said that we're aware of it, but we don't have any funds available to address this need. And the reason they said that is they wanna see a return on, on investment from addressing the social needs. They wanna see it improving health outcomes. They wanna see it reducing costs or perhaps even both of those factors. There's obviously an economic benefit to hospitals by addressing needs such as transportation. <clears throat> it can improve uh, patient throughput. I don't know how many of you have been in emergency rooms that are clogged up because patients that need to be admitted can't get up to the room and get a bed because Mrs. Jones is still in that bed at one o'clock because she doesn't have any way to get home. Uh, that direct cost of that bed could cost the hospital several hundred, uh, several thousand dollars a day. And so improving throughput has a significant financial benefit. We believe it decreases the direct cost of care and obviously can increase revenue, especially on the outpatient side. It reduces risk for readmissions. We're all aware of the fact that CMS now penalizes hospitals based upon readmission rates within a 30-day period. It reduces uncompensated care because it provides patient th patients the resources they need to use the hospital appropriately. <clears throat> patients who need to come to the emergency room in an appropriate manner but can't get to the emergency room because of lack of transportation often winds up as an inpatient, high cost, high acuity with uncompensated care. And equally important is, you know, the American Hospital Association recently surveyed fifth, uh, community hospitals, nonprofit hospitals. There were 56% of those who have really begun to focus on what's required now by the IRS to keep their tax exempt status. And that is they have to develop a community health assessment document over a, that talks about their strategic plan to address community health needs over a multi-year period. And more importantly, they have to post this document on their website so it's easily accessible for, for all to see. Beginning to invest in social determinants like transportation we believe becomes a key structural part of that community health needs assessment. So we pulled a little bit of information. This came off the uh, 2017 Medicare cost report for a, a hospital system here in, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. <clears throat> we took a look at uh, just their, tw their top 20 outpatient medical diagnoses looked at their annual visits per year, calculated the appointments per day, and calculated the revenue per visit. <clears throat> it's 
uh, easily uh, achievable to assume that hospital outpatient departments will have somewhere between 25 and 30 percent no-show rate. So we said, let's just say transportation is a, thir a third of the reasons for that. So we projected that if they're running an 8% no-show rate now due to lack of transportation, and you could reduce that down to a 2% no-show rate, you see they'd be able to recover a little over a million dollars of an additional revenue, and yet only incur the cost of about $58,000 uh, to provide transportation for those payments. So that's a 16.8 times uh, ROA just for that one outpatient department, just for the 20 medical outpatient diagnoses. So when you extrapolate those figures across multiple outpatient departments for all outpatient medical departments, there's a huge opportunity there to drive additional revenue, significant additional revenue, and also generate a strong ROA going forward. Finally, before I turn it over to Laura, <clears throat> payers now are really beginning to also realize the value of transportation. Uh, a lot of the regulatory barriers that existed have been removed. Uh, a lot of the funding barriers are being removed. <clears throat> and 80% of all the commercial uh, payers in the United States have come out and they said they proactively plan to address social determinants of health over the next a five-year period. Medicaid is the largest payer for medical transportation. You can see nationwide pays over five billion dollars. CMS recognized the value of transportation and passed a uniformity standard that allows Medicare Advantage plans now to offer supplemental uh, to offer transportation as a supplemental benefit in 2019. And we're seeing in a lot of the markets Medicare Advantage plans uh, introducing that uh, this year as a benefit. Historically, it's been covered under Medicare Part B if it has a physician's order. And here in Texas, Governor Abbott recently signed House Bill 1576, which allowed Medicaid managed care organizations to contract directly with companies like Senderide for non-emergent medical transportation. So the payer community, the provider community, we believe are really beginning to realize the value of transportation and, and partner, partnering up going forward. So let me turn it over to Laura and she'll talk a little bit about how to choose the right transportation partner. Hello everyone. Thank you again for joining this webinar and allowing us the opportunity to provide our point of view on transportation and how it can increase revenue and impact social determinants of health. Uh, the second part of this presentation will address how to choose the right transportation partner. So I may have a um, slightly different opinion, seeing as how I am providing transportation, but I'm approaching this from the initial perspective that I built Cinderite upon. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, again, I'm a practicing healthcare attorney, and I found myself after a major back surgery needing transportation to physical therapy. I had spent about a week uh, about, actually about a month on my back recovering from the surgery and had physical therapy appointments three days a week for the next six weeks. Um, I relied on family and friends to take care of all of my needs while I was recovering and thought, you know, I can get to physical therapy on my own. So the first day I called a typical rideshare company. Um, before I made it to my front door, they'd actually canceled the ride, charged me $5 and had left somewhere down the street. So I thought, okay, that's on me. I should have been at the door. So the next day I called a taxi cab and I was at the front door. Um, the taxi driver didn't offer any door-to-door -door assistance. He wait, waited in the car for me to get there. On the way to the uh, appointment, I was thinking to myself, my reflexes are compromised because I'm on hydrocodone, hence I can't drive. And yet I'm trusting myself to this person that I don't know how well he or she is vetted. I don't know if they're gonna take me to my appointment or go a different way. Um, and will anyone even know if I don't make it to my appointment? So I thought there's got to be another option. And so I thought I would look for the next one, which happened to be just a wheelchair accessible vehicle. So that left a huge um, point where there really wasn't an opportunity for transportation for someone who needed a little bit of extra assistance, but not wheelchair accessible assistance. So I thought, I wonder if I could solve this problem. So I 
pulled upon my historical knowledge, my expertise, and I started building the platform and all of the recipe ingredients that I thought were cr critical to allowing one of my clients to contract with a vendor to provide transportation. So that's the frame of mind that I entered into Cinderide. So the first item here is you would want a vendor who understands the legal and regulatory aspects. So for example, the software, the technology all needs to be HIPAA compliant, um, needs to comply with high tech and high trust. Um, the drivers and all of the employees need to be trained and understand the importance of uh, protected health information. And all the drivers need to have business associate agreements that carry through from the provider entity through send a ride all the way down to the subcontractor level of the driver. So the legal and regulatory aspects checked. Um, the next process is to use a comprehensive process to select and train their drivers. As I alluded to with my ride in the taxi cab, I wasn't entirely sure what they did to vet that driver. So I think um, in this industry, definitely a seven year national and county by county criminal background investigation, definitely a comparison on the sex offender database registry, um, seven year motor vehicle record search. Uh, nowadays, you should also compare it against the terrorist database. Check that the individual is an actual US citizen uh, by comparing document identification and compare them against the OIG exclusion list, which is a very critical piece that is overlooked by a lot of transportation providers. If you're receiving medical, I'm sorry, Medicare, Medicaid funding or from the federal government, it's critical that you not have someone in your chain that is on the OIG exclusion list. Then I thought about the state of the art scheduling platform. It has to be something that again is HIPAA compliant, um, very easy to use and um, very easy to train on and has to be, according to the next bullet, very easily integrated into the scheduling uh, process. So not just from an EHR perspective, not just integrating with patient records and electronic medical records, but also in the daily workflow. Um, transportation and scheduling, it should not be a hiccup in the clinician's workflow. It should be something that's seamless and takes 30 seconds to take care of. Um, next would be curb to curb service is not the best option. As indicated in my story, Door-to-door -door service is, is actually critical, especially for patients. Um, I've also, based on my experience with Cinderide, learned that a lot of people um, experience great anxiety when they approach a hospital and they don't know where they're going. Hospitals are very big institutions and I've learned that there are a number of appointments missed simply because people cannot find where they're going in the medical facility. So you would want a transportation provider that picked the, the person up at their residence and brought them into the institution, into their actual appointment. If they're in dialysis or the blood lab, wherever they are, actually taking them where they need to go so that that person doesn't arrive and then uh, doesn't make it to where they need to be. Um, in addition, you'll want a company that provides you with performance guarantees and metrics um, that can stand behind what they say they can do. Um, for example, um, how many ratings by riders, ratings by businesses, where do they stand? Um, for example, one uh, very stark difference between Senderide and other companies is that we have a 1-800 number that you can call and you can actually reach a human being. Um, I have a number of providers and drivers that tell me other companies they've worked with, it's nearly impossible to reach a human being. You have to go through an app, you have to send a text message or an email. Senderide actually has a customer service representatives that are bilingual, that are on the phone, able to answer questions edit rides, make changes, help you find your rider, et cetera. Um, in addition, a lot of hospitals are a little leery of using rideshare for appointments such as maybe a colonoscopy um, because they don't allow their transportation to be public transportation for the patient. Um, you would want a transportation provider that is considered private transportation so that you can meet that need. Um, to accomplish this, you would want to make sure that the driver is known to both the patient and the provider in advance, and you have a way to reach that provider, I'm sorry, that driver. Um, if you need them to show up early, you need to contact them and tell them to come a little bit later. If it's public transportation, you can't make that connection. You need private transportation so that you can do that. Another opportunity um, for a vendor would be to allow them to wait during that appointment. Um, so as an example, we partner with a lot of oncology clinics and infusion therapy is typically a very short appointment. So our drivers can stay in the um, hospital during the appointment and then turn around and take the person right back home. So offering um, the ride onward and return to the same driver is very important 
for a lot of your patients, um, they want to see the continuity of the same driver picking them up and taking them home. Um, so you want a vendor who can also offer the same ride to the driver on onward and return, and even recurring rides, maybe for dialysis several days a week. Um, it's important to a lot of elderly people to have the same individual picking them up. They establish rapport and they very much appreciate that. So those are a few of the evaluation items that I would recommend. So to give you an idea of how send a ride stacks up, um, send a ride is a transportation network carrier company because we have drivers that are independent contractors using their own vehicle. So I'm comparing that to a broker model that um, you may be familiar with circulation or round trip, um, Logisticare who are brokers, they contract out the rides through other networks, often Uber and Lyft. Rideshare is the next column, which is Uber and Lyft, and then you have your opportunity for a taxi. So our differentiators, again, created first and foremost for the healthcare industry with someone who understands and appreciates the regulations that you must comply with on a daily basis. In addition, our drivers, which are called care partners, are actually recruited from the healthcare industry. Uh, most of our drivers, it turns out, are over the age of 55. Most are retired from the healthcare industry and genuinely appreciate giving back to the community and providing a compassionate service. In addition, back to the compliance of, with HIPAA and having BAA signed by the drivers, that is critically important to a model that you would use and send a ride checks that box. We can also provide key analytics for our clients. So if you wanna know how many locations are booking rides and which departments and which patients, uh, we can help you with that. If you want to know, if you wanna put a cap on how much money a particular department is allowed to use on transportation or how many rides a particular patient is allowed to have, we can cap that, we can customize the dashboard and we can provide key analytics. Additional features, um, as I mentioned, it's a concierge service that's door to door. Um, and we can also wait during the ride. Um, going back to my personal example of not feeling safe, um, one of the things that we offer, all of our rides are recorded during the duration of the ride. All of the audio is recorded and maintained on our HIPAA compliance server. Um, so if there's ever a question of whether something happened in the car, if the rider got to where they were going, all of the audio is recorded. Um, we have an app in the App Store, and if one of your patients downloads the app, then they can actually watch live video of the inside of the car as well. In addition, we are integrated with electronic health records with several systems. We offer three levels of integration, which makes the workflow very easy. So this is a little bit redundant, so I don't wanna uh, spend too much time on it. Um, our drivers are recruited from the healthcare industry. I went through the comprehensive background investigation that we do. In addition, we also do in-person interviews and in-person car inspections, and we renew those car inspections. We also do continuous monitoring, which means once a month we check the OIG database and we're notified on a continuous basis if anything were to pop up on an NVR or a background investigation. Some of our clients have found that our drivers, because they're from the healthcare industry, are able to provide special needs, and they've actually taken it a step further and said, can your drivers provide um, can your drivers have first aid and CPR training? Now, just as a note, our drivers are not providers of healthcare. Um, they are drivers, but it makes a lot of clients feel very comfortable knowing that the driver could do that. Um, an example is the Epilepsy Foundation is a partner with Cinderide, and they trained our drivers on how to deal with grand mal seizures, and now any ride that they uh, book only goes to drivers who know how to deal with the grand mal seizure. So um, specialty training is also very important for several clients. I mentioned performance and quality metrics, and I think it's um, important here to kind of show you how Cinderite is different. Um, we have a patient no-show rate of 0.9%, and I know that may be difficult to understand and to believe, so I'll let you know that the app was built with the intention of making sure people make it to their appointments. So I built on the experiences that I had personally and what would have prevented me from getting to my appointment and what would have enabled me to get to my appointment. Each of those things is built into our software. So the, the care partner, which is our driver, is able to, with the touch of a button, call the person who booked the ride, clarify the address, the location. They're also able to call the patient or text the patient, let them know where they are, clarify the address. Those types of things, as well as a 24-hour 1-800 number accessible to just drivers, 
um, allows them to interface with Senderide and make sure that the patient is located and brought to their appointment or brought home. We have 100% customer retention since we began operations two and a half years ago. 96% timeliness. Um, our rides are originated with, uh, I'm sorry, the ride begins within 15 minutes of the scheduled time is our performance guarantee. Our rider satisfaction rate is 4.95 out of five and clients is 4.94 out of five. And I'm proud to say that we've had zero safety issues since we've launched, knock on wood. <laughs> Why we are successful, I believe is attributed to a number of factors. Um, one, we have identified a key market of drivers that willingly want to give back to the community. I regularly do focus groups with my drivers and ask them, what do you like about Cinderide? What could we do better? And a lot of them tell me, first of all, I love the fact that I can call and get a customer service rep and get a question answered or a situation dealt with immediately. Um, secondly, I love that I feel like I'm giving back to the community. As I mentioned, many of our drivers are retired and the ability to have something to do during the day, um, or they perhaps have been in those waiting rooms or they've seen a family member in those waiting rooms, allows them to give back. Also, I want to point out the technology was built to be very industry friendly, compatible and compliant. And the industry's really never had a workable solution. So again, again going back to my personal example, um, I felt like I was a very resourceful individual and I couldn't find a solution that worked for me in that particular situation. So while other rideshare companies are really focused on worldwide rider mobility, um, getting everything to you wherever you are, our sole focus is the healthcare industry and getting patients to their providers. And again, we are recruiting uh, drivers in Dallas as we are expanding every day in the metropolitan area. So if you know someone that fits that um, description that wants to drive for Send a Ride, I would absolutely appreciate you sending them to our website to apply. And uh, I will turn it over to you guys for questions now. Yeah, uh, this is Steve. Uh, we've got a few questions coming in and please people continue to write those. But, you know, I guess uh, a couple of questions we've got, Greg and Laura, is who actually pays for the transportation? What about, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, and insurance? How is that handled? That's a really good question that we're presented with often. Um, Medicare does pay for this as a Medicare Advantage benefit. That's a very new development beginning 2020. Um, so we have a number of health plans that are putting us in their network now to be able to be uh, a provider for 2020. Uh, this has been a Medicaid mandated benefit since 1966. So Medicaid definitely pays for this. Um, and we're seeing that a number of health plans are including this as a value added benefit. So we have a number of health insurance plans, uh, a lot of them that are working with self-funded employers that provide this as a benefit for their employees. So it's a, um, a case by case basis, but we're seeing a number of private payers paying for this now as well. And Steve, the, uh, the medical groups and the hospitals that have worked through the economics of this and, and do realize the cost reduction opportunities and the revenue enhancement opportunities uh, often pay for the rides as well. Uh, <clears throat> in Oklahoma, Oklahoma is one of the demonstration states for the CPC Plus program. Uh, I don't believe it existed in Texas, but a lot of the medical groups in the state that participate in that use a portion of the care management fees that they get on a monthly basis to pay for patient transportation because they know in the long run it's going to keep folks out of the hospital, keep them out of the emergency rooms, and make sure they get to the physician for the uh, chronic care management that often they require. I'll expand on that right. for just a moment and, and say that one of our partners here in Oklahoma that has a, a CPC Plus program actually had a demonstrable ROI attributable to just using Cinderide. Um, at the national conference in Baltimore this spring, they presented a, a, a white paper on their benefits and their determined ROI from using Senderide, which has actually generated quite a bit of interest and in business for us. So we do have proof in the pudding. Let me ask you uh, another. Uh, let me ask you another question. And uh, if physicians use your service. Is paying for transportation considered 
I mean, I understand the need for the transportation and the social determinants of health. But would the OIG say, is this an inducement to seek service? That is a good question as well, um, a very specific legal question. And a few years ago, I would have said yes, but the OIGs recognized the social determinants of health and they've recognized that transportation actually can reduce healthcare costs and improve the healthcare outcomes. And they have created a safe harbor specifically for transportation. So no, good. it is not considered an inducement. So let me ask you, I know you've, you've, you've done over 27,000 rides and I know you've done surveys. Have you reached any conclusion on how using this type of transportation can improve the overall patient experience and frankly, survey scores? You know, absolutely. The, the real, I think the real competitive advantage that we have been able to enjoy has been the the ability to deliver a concierge level of service at a market rate. Concierge, by that I mean, as Laura mentioned, drivers getting out of the car, going up, meeting the patient at their door, escorting them back to the car, taking them to the physician's office or to the hospital, getting out of the car, escorting them to where they really need to be. Um, we are finding that that has a huge impact on patient satisfaction scores. Um, and up to this point, it's probably been, has been the best differentiator that we have. But the one thing that, that Laura mentioned that we found particularly interesting, and it really ties back into patient satisfaction. Uh, we recently did a survey of all of our drivers and uh, asked them what they liked best about uh, Send a Ride. And I guess I would have, being a financial guy, I guess I would have anticipated it's a great side job. It's an opportunity to make some money after retirement, those kinds of things. The number one response was, we really like the opportunity to give back to our community. And that, 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 uh, that empathy, that feeling carries through in their job performance to the extent that we have many patients now who will request a specific driver to come and, and take them because they've developed an actual personal relationship with that driver. And that's something that you're really not going to find in traditional uh, rideshare uh, vendor relationships. I'll expand right. on that as well. Um, we've also had some clients that tell us they really appreciate the send a ride concierge ride home because it is the last interaction that they have with the rider or the patient rather. Um, and it gives a, a great impression of the hospital and how caring um, and compassionate they are towards the patient to get them home. Um, one of the things we can do is on the way home, we can stop at the pharmacy and pick up their prescription, help them with any errands before they get home. Um, so the hospitals have told us, we like the fact that you extend that very compassionate service that the patient regards as kind of part of the hospital visit. Um, we've even had some hospitals ask if they could co-brand with us. Um, so it does help significantly with those patient satisfaction scores. You know, that's a good point, Laura, because one of the questions that we received was if the patient needed to run by the pharmacy or get, you know, something like a medical durable equipment picked up, would you do it? And you just answered that. We, we did have a note that someone sent in, and I, I want to make sure everyone knows this presentation will be sent out, and, and Chris will make sure and post the link to the presentation because we got a comment from someone they were really enjoying this but it was a lot to absorb and rather than take a lot of notes they wanted a copy of the presentation laura we have another question and and that question was you did touch on value base but when you look at accountable care organizations how do you feel that this transportation will really assist in an ACO? Well, <clears throat> you know, ACOs, uh, I'll use the term make their money. That's probably not the right term, but they realize financial gain by really managing the population of the lives that, th that they cover. And quite often, 
they assume a population that had, has uh, significant chronic conditions. So the importance of getting the patient to the physicians, mainly the primary care physicians and the ACOs, really can't be understated. And that's, why, that's one of the reasons why the OIG uh, uh, lightened up their regulation on physicians being able to pay for transportation and not consider it an inducement because they found out and they realized that access to primary care is one of the key drivers for the financial success and, and the clinical success of an ACO. So we think it's a, a natural relationship and we're in the process of talking to uh, several of the larger ACOs in the Dallas-Fort Worth market uh, currently. Right. We have one final question and we could have some more questions coming in but there's one in the hopper and it's basically saying based on your experience what practice areas have you seen that would have the greatest return on investment when providing transportation for patients that is a good question and i would say on our, based on our experience oncology is prim, uh, the primary utiliz utilizer um, followed by nephrology for dialysis centers, um, ER discharge, outpatient discharge, and another one that you may not expect is clinical trials. Um, there's a number of organizations, cardiovascular um, and, and oncology clinical trials. And as you know, it's critical to make sure those patients are there for those appointments and for those treatments, or they might uh, risk being thrown out of that study. Um, so that is another lead utilizer of Senderide. Well, that's uh, that's really that's really good. I think we've covered all the questions to point. Chris, do you have any other questions? Any more in here? Well, uh, I, I just want to say, Laura, uh, what a what a what a great service that that you've done, and you and Greg uh, have done a great job of explaining this. And I'm gonna turn it back over to you to just see if you have any closing comments. But on behalf of everyone this has been quite informative thank you so much um, I, I, in closing i would just thank every participant for their time today as greg mentioned early on uh, finding a few minutes out of your day to watch a presentation is is very difficult to do so we're very grateful for your time um, our information is on the website if you have any follow-up questions that you didn't think of during the session um, I am happy to answer those to the best of my ability, whether you choose to use Cinderite or not. Um, I have a passion for this. It's probably no coincidence that my last name is Fleet. Um, so I have a passion for transportation uh, for the healthcare industry. So I'm happy to answer any lingering questions. Yeah. Well, as you, were, as you were saying, kind of your closing remarks, some more questions came in. And I know you touched on these, but I'm just going to read it as is. How does the insurance part of this program work with the driver and with the client? How, how is it coordinated? Uh, well, it varies a little bit from payer to payer, but since it is a covered benefit, uh, the payers that we uh, contract with, primarily the Medicare Advantage plans, <clears throat> we actually just send a monthly invoice to them, uh, similar to a, a claim form, and they uh, reimburse us usually with a, a check or an electronic funds transfer that covers the uh, covers the business that we did for them for the month. So uh, so, some other plans uh, are asking for patients to pay a small copay. It presents a little bit of a challenge in Oklahoma because rideshare drivers are not allowed to collect funds from patients. Uh, so we're we're having some innovative discussions with, with health plans, but usually, uh, usually, Steve, it's just done on an invoice payment on a monthly basis. Got it. The other question we received was, uh, was a repeat of a previous question. It's already been asked and answered. So uh, we just want to thank both of you for a great presentation, and we certainly thank our participants as we continue to deal with transportation, social determinants of health. It's great to know that you're fill, filling the need for a lot of people. So with that, thank you very much, and I hope everyone has a great rest of the day.